And so Ben and I are gonna talk about today, a lot of the things that you can do in those moments. Um, that, you know, in these moments where we feel overwhelmed or we feel stressed, you know, these are exactly the moments that we're all facing all day, every day. And so it's a great opportunity to, to talk about that. And I'll start with that, Ben. You know, today, you know, right now we start this webinar, we've got, you know, uh, 100 people or so listening today. And you know, in this moment, what did you feel uh, when we were freezing? What happened for you? Um, well, so even just starting the webinar in and of itself, I had the spike of adrenaline um, and my heart racing. Um, my thoughts started racing also about, oh man, like if what's going to happen if Fader isn't able to participate here, I'm going to have to carry this thing all by myself. I'm not sure I'm ready to do that. You know, uh, one of the things we're going to get to here is the negativity bias that we all have. But I think, you know, when that, when, when things start to go wrong, just like everybody else, I start to jump to what are all the worst, worst case scenarios that could happen here. Um, you know, I started thinking, is it my internet? I, I don't know, if, you know, like, are you going to be mad at me that my internet's not working here? So, uh, just got to breathe and wait and, uh, have faith that things are going to, going to work out here, you know? I think uh yeah well i'm sorry to say this is your end of your career band at union square practice and sports strata we made a decision and i made a decision over text yeah it's all based on internet ability these days right well, but no it's seriously i mean in these moments we 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 feel threat right like we feel like oh shoot everything is going down and we feel this level of that we're in danger and and how do you handle that how do you recover from that what do you what do you do well, for me, it's, it's a lot about breathing. Um, it's a lot about breathing and slowing my heart rate down and uh, trying to figure out what the best next step is. The, the interesting thing about positive psychology for me is how much crossover there is with performance psych, um, which we both work on a lot, I know. And, um, you know, so for me, I, I think about it a lot as, a, as an opportunity to use some of the stuff that I practice and some of the stuff I talk with my clients about. So um, breathing is a huge part of it. And then self-talk, like I was saying, just reminding myself um, of things that are gonna be helpful for me rather than letting my thoughts race to all the negative possibilities. Right, so it's being able to say, I'm not going to, I, I'm, I'm gonna realize that my, physically I feel overwhelmed. And in my head, my thoughts are racing, but I'm going to redirect my focus to the things I control in the moment. Right. And there's something actually really uh, interesting about this, too, for me, that actually once something like this happens, I get a lot more comfortable. It's kind of like if you make an error um, in a baseball game or something, then for the rest of the game, you're not nervous anymore. Um, right. It, it reminds me, actually, my when my wife and I got weddings, uh, got married, some people know this, there was a hurricane. And um, it's sort of lucid, like besides, besides the fact that it was uh, super, super stressful uh, in the lead up, it actually made the party even more fun because everyone was able to more easily let go of the need for everything to go perfectly well. So it kind of reminds me of that right now. Well, I mean, I know that story well. And it's sort of <laughs> anyone who's getting married, the worst nightmare, right? You know, you're about to have a... A wedding and there's a natural disaster um, but it you know reminds you of these times we're, we're all in the in the eye of the hurricane right now yeah i mean one, one thing that's really interesting about positive psych is that uh, and it, it's one of the things i wanted to start with is that i think it it gets a bad name or or it is misunderstood and so i think if we're going to dive into that here um we it's a really good place to start um so uh i think this is this is okay that i ask you questions as well um but what do you from your perspective what are some of the b biggest misconceptions that uh, people have about what it means to study positive psychology and, and what it means to use it in your life i mean i think the biggest misconception has to do with that that positive psychology is just about thinking that things are going to work out great 
I think that, you know, one of the biggest misconceptions comes from, from the idea of the mix up between positive psychology and optimism. Actually, you know what, we're just curious about you guys. You know, Ben and I are going to talk a lot about what positive psychology is and how you can apply it. But just thinking about that misconception, we're curious about you all here who are listening. Thanks again for staying with us through all those, the, that little technical uh, hurricane. But just, uh, David, if you could throw up that questionnaire, we're curious about whether you think of things as uh, glass half full or glass half empty. In your, in your life, you know, go ahead and, and put up when you think about the world and your life as you see it. Are th is the glass half full or is the glass half empty? You know, I think, you know, Ben, as people are filling this out, that's the major thing that I think about is that I think that people misunderstand. And, and yes, I mean, you can be an optimist, which I happen to be, and I know you are too, but um, that's kind of secondary to employing these ideas of, of positive psychology. It's not, you, you, can not, you can move away from that thinking and still use positive psychology. What do you think? Yeah, this is interesting. We have sort of an even split. Yeah, so we've got we've got a little bit more uh, of the optimists here, and you know, I mean, I I, I want to make you know an invite actually as I'm looking at this. This is an invitation to all the the people who are on the half empty side to say positive psychology can be for you too. It doesn't have to be that you're looking. And by the way, I think there's probably I would guess um, that a lot of the folks here are people that are in the half empty box because not you know just that's who they are but just because of the times what do you think yeah i mean i think it gets even even harder to be optimistic when things are harder and we you know the glass half full glass half empty question really brings up what i think is the biggest misconception in positive psych which is that there's a right answer to that question um you know the idea that in order to be optimistic one needs to completely deny or pretend that negative things are not happening or are not true, um, I think can be really destructive in terms of gaining some benefit from some of the skills and, and techniques that come out of positive Because um, we know that denying that negative things are happening or pretending that things are better than they are is just a way for those things to come back and punch you in the face harder later. Right. Speaking about get, getting punched in the face, I'm gonna to try to punch myself in the face by starting my video again. We're gonna see what happens, everybody. Hold on to your hold on to your Zoom microphones. I'm back. There he is. All right, are we frozen? You're We're good. good. All I'm right. No longer speaking well, so, to a sports strata icon, which is excellent. I, I, I'm here, I'm back. Yeah, so everybody, so you know, Sports Strata is our branch of Unisquare practice that focus on, focuses on performance coaching. And so we work with athletes and people in business and all different areas of life on how to be the best people that they can be. Um, so back to you, Ben. So when, when you're talking about these misconceptions, um, how would you clarify the distinction if you went a little bit deeper and, and explained from your perspective, how is, what is positive psychology? Uh, so for me, positive psychology is really the study of how people thrive and traditionally psychology has been all about how people suffer right what makes things go wrong and positive psychology you know martin seligman mihai cheek sent mihai these guys in the 90s and late 80s decided hey maybe we should look at uh how people do well instead of just how people do poorly and so it got the term positive psych because it's about positive emotions or positive outcomes um, but a lot of it is about how do you make the best out of your situation rather than how do you just pretend that everything is great. And so you see this in sports all the time when, uh, you know, the positive coaching Alliance, which I think is a great organization, but again, with the terminology, it can get kind of confusing because people think, Oh, these, these guys just, they want to just pretend everything is unicorns and rainbows. And that's not my reality. And so I, I can't really listen to what they have to say. It doesn't, it doesn't ring true to me at all. Right. And I think in a lot of ways, it's a shame. I mean, the, the PCA does a tremendous job at getting positive psych out there. And I think, as you said, you know, it, it's, it's confusing the term. And I, the way that you described it, I think, is very clear for folks. I mean, what you're talking about, Ben, is the sense that wherever we are, we can feel a little bit better. 
And, and in essence, I think what you're saying is positive psychology is the pursuit of, of personal and um, interpersonal well-being. Right. I, I think that's accurate. I think they call it life satisfaction in a lot of the studies from positive psychology. You know, this idea that happiness is the goal. I think, you know, we, we talked about having that as, as the title of this webinar because it's such a catch-all pop psyche way of thinking about this. Um, but in reality, right, and, and this, is the, this is the quote that, that we found about that, happiness cannot be pursued, it must ensue. One must have a reason to be happy. That, you know, Viktor Frankl is a Holocaust survivor and did a ton of writing while in the concentration camps. And so faced some of the worst conditions you possibly could. Um, and so I, I think it's really interesting to think about the fact that a lot of positive psychology techniques are, are aimed at people who are struggling or having a hard time. And how do they really um, do a little bit better or find hope in the darkness? Right. So, you know, and for those of you that haven't read Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, it's a it's a account of his first person experience as being a Holocaust survivor and then becoming a very influential psychiatrist. And and most would think the founder of existential or humanistic psychiatry, psychology, or one of the main main people who impacted it. So, um, you know, when you think about that, this idea. Let, let's break down this quote. You know, how does this apply day to day for people right now in this crisis? This idea of pursuing happiness and that it has to come out um, of a reason or an action. What does that mean for people right now? Um, so, I think one of the things that makes me think about is that uh, the studies about what people think make them happy versus what actually makes them happy. You know, some of the most interesting research from positive psychology is all about um, this conclusion that people are actually terrible predictors at what's going to make them happy. Um, most people will answer that um, having lots of free time and relaxing on the couch without much to do is what's going to make them happy. Uh, but when polled at random times, it turns out that working and being engaged or experiencing relationships or things in your life with, with high meaning, even if they're not short-term pleasurable, are actually the things that produce happiness. And so what it means for people right now, um, I think is that we have to be very intentional about how we spend our time and what we focus on. Uh, I think if there's one big takeaway I hope people come out of this webinar with is that sometimes, um, what we want to do in the short term may not actually be the thing that's going to be most helpful for us. Um, and so I think that's especially true right now because when our emotions are, or when we're in a hard situation and our emotions are telling us that, well, we don't want to get out of bed. We just want to do nothing all day that, that that's actually not going to be the most helpful thing. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because I think a lot of us, including me, have had moments where, you know, we just want to kind of binge watch Netflix, turn our brains off, or conversely, just get sucked into CNN and are constantly watching updates about the news. And I think what you're saying, the large part is, well, that's understandable. In some way, what happiness will ensue by pursuing more meaningful and more value-based activities. Right, and being really intentional about how you pay attention and how you look at things, right? Rather than just doing it automatically, uh, I think we'll come back to this, but this idea of a negativity bias, that when we get scared, our brain automatically, because of evolution, looks for how things are going wrong. And that we have to be actually very purposeful in terms of making an adjustment there. You so let's talk about... Yeah, yeah, let's talk about those adjustments. And, and actually, if you could break it down for us, you know, what, so what are the components? We've talked about meaning a little bit, but what are the, what are the components of, of positive psychology? What, what makes it up? The components, so I think uh, there, there are different uh, buckets that, that have been created 
to talk about the things that make life satisfying. Um, and so uh, there are people who really don't like the bucket approach. I think it, it, it simplifies things uh, a bit, but I think it also helps to clarify um, what we're talking about. So there's a acronym PERMA um, that Martin Seligman came up with that I think is really helpful. So the P stands for positive emotions, things like gratitude and compassion, right? Uh, the most effective positive psychology intervention to date is keeping a gratitude journal in the morning, right? Having a list of three things that you're grateful for on a daily basis. It's one of the most effective ways to cultivate positive emotions. Then E stands for engagement. So like I was just talking about, the studies from Cheek Sent Me High about can I engage more in what I'm doing? Can I fully focus on what I'm doing in the present? Then R is for relationships. So relationships are one of those uh, consistent sources of life satisfaction. M is for meaning. So connection to something larger than yourself. And then A is for accomplishment, which, uh, you know, that one's, a little bit more complicated than just accomplishment. It's about enjoying the process of getting where you're going rather than just the end accomplishment, which again connects to uh, performance psych. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so interesting because when you think about what accomplishment is, um, that can vary so widely. And I think, you know, in some ways, uh, some of the most powerful accomplishments are just things that are consistent with our personal value. It doesn't necessarily mean starting a business, getting a degree, um, it could just mean accomplishment could be, in my mind, consistently having a mindfulness practice or accomplishment around, you know, something around a, an earlier thing, like we talked about, about gratitude. Going back to that for a second, you know, um, if you were going to, if you were going to give people some concrete ideas about that, or actually not even concrete ideas, how do you practice these ideas? So if we're thinking about, you know, the positive, uh, engage, positive emotions or engagement, what are things that you do day to day, Ben? or that you work on with, with people that you're coaching or working with um, to implement this in your day-to-day -day life? Uh, so for those of you who have been tuning in to these webinars, this is a theme, Jonathan Fader theme of, of thinking about routines, right? Thinking about routines that help um, to accomplish your goal, right? And so I think for me, it's about what do I wanna put in my routine that's gonna help me um, either raise, raise the level of, of some of these perma buckets. Um, so uh, for my whole life, sports have been super engaging. And for me, I wanna make time every day to do something uh, athletic. Uh, I have a, I've been bought a little putting green or a, a putting runway that I put in my office. So spend 20, 30 minutes just putting each day, just something that I'm engaged in. Reading is also something that's really engaging for me and ties into both engagement and um, that sense of accomplishment, right? I think it's, it's about, I, I usually do reading about uh, topics I'm really interested to try to grow my understanding of it. Um, so those two tie together really well. And then the other one that I know we both do is, is a meditation practice. Or, uh, and for me, a lot of that is about gratitude and compassion. So something that's been really helpful for a couple of my clients is, um, you know, a lot of us are stuck in the house with people who we love quite a bit, but uh, with so much time together can be annoying, to say the least. And so actually spending time in the morning cultivating positive feelings towards those people right? Thinking to yourself, I hope that my younger sister has a good day today. I hope she's feeling good. I, I hope that she's happy today. I hope that my children uh, are, are feeling peaceful and at ease today, right? To even just have that thought going into the day, that's been something that I've been working on with several clients, and they've found that pretty helpful. Um, yeah, so you know, I, mean, like, I think about, like, about you. I think, well, you know, many of the same things. I mean, the, the, the gratitude practice, I was really lucky. I, you know, I, I started with parents that practiced this. So my mother would have us say before bed, three things we were grateful for, um, no repeats. So you couldn't just say video games, video games, video games, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. But, you know, that, that led to, uh, 
the same practice that I do with my two daughters. And what's really great about that is it's a, it's a nightly ritual, but make no mistake, they're not letting me out the room either without me saying to what I'm grateful for. Um, and you know, what I think is, is a challenge uh, in thinking about this for a lot of people is, you know, how do we do this in times when we're, we're riddled with worry and doubt, and there may be a lot of things that aren't, we're not grateful for. Um, and so that just, you know, that people think about this, you can be, uh, you know, really tortured by what's happening right now and really upset and some people even in grief and at the same time find these pockets of gratitude. And it can be the simple things, right? I, I mean, like today, when I think about it, I'm going to be super grateful that the, the Wi-Fi charge came back that we had a connection again, right? Um, and so thinking about, and, you know, one other thing I'll just say about this is, you know, Oftentimes, like if you think of getting an injury in your body or an athlete, um, you know, a lot of times the, the, the help for that injury is not focusing on injury, but strengthening muscles that support your body in a way that allow that muscle to heal, right? So I've had a shoulder injury and strengthening muscles in my traps and other areas that's in my back that support that and my neck. And I think when you think about it in this way, all the things that Ben's talking about, in, you know, putting energy into these buckets in engagement and your relationships, meditation, mindfulness, gratitude, are ways that you can strengthen muscles that assist during the injury of this kind of hectic time. Yeah. So I, Ben, it it reminds me of uh, the idea in sports of of finding small wins. Right. Right. That's that's one of the ways we talk about it with with some of the athletes is that. You know, we want to find small wins. It doesn't mean that we want to be really, we want to pretend to be happy about the things that are not going well. Those are, di right. those are different things. And, and oftentimes gratitude is not necessarily the, the easiest emotion to find. Sometimes hope or compassion. Um, but those, are, those are also really uh, positive experiences that can sometimes be, be easier to locate. Or, or bring to mind in some of these harder moments. Yeah. So, you know, we had a, we had a question uh, from uh, folks uh, for Q&A and I want to encourage people, um, you know, we're gonna, what we're gonna do today too, is we're gonna, as we have previously, pass the mic. And so, you know, please go ahead and write in the chat box if you have a question, because David's gonna pass the mic to someone and allow you guys to ask a question live of Ben and I, um, and for us to talk with you about, how you might apply these positive psychology ideas in your own life, how you might build more, as Ben was saying, life satisfaction, how you might build more of a connection to these different areas of your life in your own positive emotions or engagements, your own uh, relationships. So go ahead and put those questions uh, into the, into the uh, Q&A box up there um, or the chat box. And then, you know, David will, will elect someone to come online and ask us a question live. In the meantime, Ben, there's a question here. I just want to, you know, discuss with you because I think it's interesting. You know, someone asks here, do you, do you think it's good for some people to not to, some people not to have or commit to a routine? What, what are your thoughts about that? Um, I, my thoughts are that having a rigid routine can be really unhelpful. And so whether or not you think you have a routine, typically, you have some sort of routine. Um, and the question is how intentional are you being about it? So one of the things I, I believe is that rigidity creates a lot of added, added suffering, right? That the inability to be flexible with your thinking, the inability to be flexible with your behaviors is, it can be really problematic. And so I wanna just clarify that having a routine doesn't mean doing exactly the same thing every single day. Right, um, and that there's a big range in terms of what's most helpful for people. So I think in direct response to that question, no, I don't think it's necessarily um, unhelpful to not have a, a really specific routine, but that doesn't mean that you can't have, um, you know, we talk about micro and macro routines. So routines at smaller levels that, oh, when I'm in a bad mood, I have a routine for how I get in a better mood. Right? For me, working out or going for a run is definitely my go-to routine. If I'm, if I'm just not feeling right, I'm feeling really negatively, I know, okay, I, the first thing I'm gonna try to do 
to get my blood pumping and do something active. Because usually after that, I can find some way to feel better or think more clearly about it. So I don't right. do it at the same time every day, but. Right, well, I think one of the things you're saying, Ben, that I really appreciate is, you know, if, you, know you, you do have a routine. We all have uh, a routine. And, you know, is your routine something that you select or has it been selected for you in some way? And so thinking of that over, you know, even a question to yourself, as Ben is pointing out, you know, are you setting up your routine or are things being set up for you? And we all have a routine. And most of our routines are things like instrumental routines. You know, I brush my teeth, I go to work, I get on a call. But the question is, what about the routine for yourself? What about the routine for increasing these positive emotions and engagement as Ben is talking about? Um, what can you do uh, to add one thing uh, to your routine that could help? And as Ben is saying, there's these macro routines, things that we do in the general. Um, you know, what are we doing day by day? And then there's micro routines. So going back to the beginning of our coming full circle in our, in our talk today, one of the routines that, that I have and Ben has is a breathing technique. So when things get a little bit hectic, you're, you know, you're about to do a, a talk for a lot of people and, and the internet goes down, that you have something you can go to. But what we're talking about here, like a breath, right? Or even just a self-statement, as we've talked about in previous webinars, something like what's important now or what's next. Um, or, or actually, you know, what I was going to in that moment too is like, it's going to work out. I was just like, we'll figure it out. Whatever it is, we'll figure it out. That was sort of what I was saying. And it was helping me to keep calm and figure out what I needed to do next. The other thing I was thinking, and I'm curious about you too, Ben, in that is I was also thinking, what's the opportunity here? Um, you know, what, how can we think about what's happening here in a way that might be helpful to other people? And so thinking about that when you feel stressed too, how do I, and you know, maybe you could talk for a second about that, about appraisal. How do you, you know, reappraisal of things? Yeah, I think uh, that's probably the most helpful skill. Besides maybe breathing when you're having a difficult time is the ability to notice what your thought process is and then find a way to reframe it or reappraise it, like you're saying. Um, and so I think both of us probably did that early on in this webinar, it, it, is we both had the thought, okay, well, this is, this is an opportunity for us to show our, our ability to handle stress, right? Because this is kind of a stressful thing that this is happening, and we're talking about how do you use positive psychology techniques in a stressful moment, well, this is an opportunity to show people how to do that. And right away, you start to feel a little bit better about it. Um, you know, I think the COVID crisis is a really good example of something where reframing and refocusing can have an effect um, almost immediately without, without taking away from the negative stuff that's happening with it. Right. I, I, watched a, I watched a talk by a professor at NYU, Jonathan Haidt, and um, one of the things he was pointing out along the lines of reframing is that a pandemic like this has been predicted for years at this point. This wasn't a sort of out of the blue, we didn't see this coming type of thing. And it's terrible, the, the way that it's affecting so many people. At the same time, our country and our world is going to be so much more prepared for pandemics moving forward because of this experience. So both, it's a terrible experience and the world is now becoming much more capable at handling this type of situation than we were before. And so by being able to see that, happening at the same time, it can, it doesn't take away from what's being lost and feeling sad about that, but it does add feelings of hope to the experience and, and potentially meaning as well. You could right. probably do it with, with being stuck at home with your kids too. I don't have kids, but you do, right? Like I, I've talked to a lot of parents because I work with a lot of kids and then I talked to parents about, you know, it's really hard to have kids at home. And, and that seems like one of the most difficult things here. But I think it's a big opportunity to apply some of this reframing. It can happen. I mean, it can happen in every moment. 
right? Every moment is an opportunity to change how you think about stress. Um, and that, you know, uh, there's, there's another quote, I think you have a great quote about this, about sort of how things are we perceive. It's a uh, Epiclides quote or, or some, right? So it's not things that disturb us, but our interpretation of their significance. Um, you know, the idea that, well, talk us through this quote and how it applies, you know, for you or in your thoughts about life. Sure, so I mean, this, this is one of the first Stoic writers. Um, and, you know, Stoicism, I think, plays a big part in positive psychology. They're some of the, the early adopters of the positive psychology techniques of, being able to recognize your own thoughts and then see things from another perspective as well, right? And so, um, you know, I think I didn't put this one in, but uh, Albert Einstein, reality is just an illusion, albeit a very persistent one. Um, yes. Is, again, one of my favorite quotes because it, it shows you that everyone's perspective is exactly that, it's their perspective. And so you free yourself up if you're able to see things in different ways or, uh, you know, from in the way this quote is, interpret them in different ways, right? And that's not to say that, again, going back to what we talked about at the beginning, not to say that one of those ways is wrong and one of those ways is right. Because right. trying to do that is what gets people stuck. And they're like, I'm not being true to how I feel. I feel like this is a really bad thing. And now I'm looking at it as some way for the world to be more prepared, like, am I not being true to myself? Right. Which is a trap. It is a trap. And I think, you know, you're, you're giving some really good ideas about how to, how to escape the trap. Um, David, I'm curious, uh, I'm wondering if we have someone who wants to ask a question live. David? Oh, I think we do. I think we have Maureen here. So Maureen, if you, if you want to go ahead and uh, unmute yourself, welcome Maureen. Hi. Thanks for coming on and talking with us. I love these things. We go to all of them. Well, we're really happy to have you here and we're happy that, they've, that you've loved them and they've touched your life in some way. Um, what was the question you had for us? Um, well, I'm gonna read it because I'm not sure. used to talking to people this way, but... <laughs> I was wondering about tips for how to bring yourself to take the first step to having, you know, using these, t these ideas um, to try to help yourself out of this stuck and tired negative space. Sometimes it can drag on and sometimes you have a lot of intense reasons for feeling that way. And I love hearing these um, suggestions and sometimes I, it feels totally doable, but how do you help yourself when it doesn't feel doable? Well, first of all, you know, before I'm going to toss that to Ben uh, first and hear his thoughts, Maureen, but Maureen, I have to tell you that I really appreciate you asking that. Um, and I think reading it or not, it takes courage to come and ask a question like that on a live, you know, Zoom meeting. And I can tell you that, um, you know, well, actually, I'm just curious if you feel like Maureen, and sometimes it's hard to take that first step, just put into the chat box. Um, me too. So just go and put in the chat box there um, and write, you know, me as well. If you sometimes have trouble taking that first step, whether it's about changing your thinking um, or about uh, anything like that, um, you know, just go me as well or, you know, I feel that way as well. Right. You know, so there's a lot of people that are writing in that box, Maureen. So it's, it's something that other people are experiencing that we're all all doing it and that you know there there may be as someone said it may be superficial or it may feel feel um, like there's obstacles that are too big so ben and i'll talk briefly about our thoughts about how to get going with some of this stuff uh, ben what are your thoughts about that um first of all i think that's the biggest challenge here you know i think you, you nailed it with the thing that people get frustrated with positive psychology about which is you know it, it's yeah sure i'll do that but i don't feel it I, do, I talk with my clients a lot about the difference between thinking something and feeling something. And that oftentimes there's a disconnect with some of the, you know, you can do a gratitude journal, but you don't feel grateful, you know, and, and that's one of the biggest challenges here. And 
to to acknowledge that that that's going to be the case at the beginning is super important right um as a direct answer to that question my number one um suggestion would be to try to um team up with other people in your lives who also want to do some of this stuff um for me and and this is definitely and now talking more from personal experience but for for me when i have a teammate or somebody who uh i i have to be there for also right if i agree that i'm going to get on a meditation call with somebody every morning for a week i'm so much more likely to do it it goes all the way back to high school you know having a workout buddy you're going to go lift because you don't want to let them down not because you want to go um but the other thing that's really important to to say here is that a lot of the research shows that when you start doing these exercises, you don't get the benefits right away, but that if you stick with them, the benefits do show up in the long term. That's right? critical. That's it goes critical. Back to that first yeah. quote that we put up. It's super critical, and I, you know, I agree with you, Ben. Everything you said. You know, find a buddy, find an accountability partner, anyone. It could be over text, where you just you know following that. And the other thing is, you know, for behavior to stick, as Ben saying, you know, it really has to have a cue, something that tells us it's time to do it, in action, writing in a gratitude journal, and then a reinforcement. You know, what I what I have here in my office is I just have a little light bright that I bought, you know, online. And every day that I do my behavior, this is about writing. I want to write every day, so I just put a little light bright thing in there, and then you know I can see it lighting up. So it's it's you know it's simple things like that that can help you. Um, the other thing I would just say is pick one small thing and try to do it for an extended period of time. The smallest thing. It could be like things like putting your feet on the ground in the morning as soon as you wake up. Um, or it could be just like in your, in, writing in your phone one thing you're grateful for. A small action. Because as Ben's saying, you don't feel the reinforcement usually until you've established the habit. And so trying to do those couple things I think are really pragmatic things that, that Ben and I could recommend to you. Ben, I really want to thank you for being on. You have one more thing because we, we're going to wrap up. Yeah, I just have one other thought on that, which is that judging yourself for not being good at it is the other thing I see all the time. That people will try something they, they want to do, they want to feel more grateful, they'll try the gratitude journal, not feel grateful, and then go, I'm bad at this. And then you're actually negatively, re, you know, you're actually like making it something that you don't want to do in the future. And right. so giving yourself credit for doing these things, even if they don't work right away, is another key to having them stick. No doubt, right? So just anticipating that it's gonna be hard. And when it's hard, not attributing it to us, attributing it to the fact that this is what it takes, it, it, it is hard. And so then you know that you're gonna kind of push through in some way, I like that as well. Ben, thanks so much. I and mean, if you have questions for Ben, please reach out, Ben Oliva at Union Square Practice. Um, I want to thank you again, Ben, for coming on, for, for being my accountability partner uh, in all things, but also um, in, this, uh, in this activity and, and sticking through with me through this internet disconnection. It was great to have you on this. This was very fun. I would like to do more um, in the future. And Something tells me that, that you will be doing more in the future. But thank, after thank you for doing it. Yeah, it's my pleasure, man. I, as you know, I really, I enjoy it. I have fun and I'm happy to share what we know with everybody and, and hear their thoughts and excellent questions. So thanks to Maureen again for that question. Um, then we'll be back, but not before we hear from some super, super talented and experienced child clinical psychologists. These are child psychologists who are at Union Square Practice and are gonna be coming next week um, I believe at, in the evening time at 8.30 p.m. We're going to change our time to make sure that all these parents can get there, including myself. Uh, so we'll have Dr. Perret and Dr. Kumba who's going to, who are going to come, um, and they're going, to, they're going to talk to us about how to, how to deal with all these parenting things and kid questions that come up. It's a crazy time to be a parent. Well, all times are pretty crazy, but this is the craziest that I've experienced in some ways. So we're gonna welcome them to, to our webinar on Union Square Practice. So please tune in next week, 8.30 p.m. Uh, to talk to these excellent child clinical psychologists. Again, thanks so much, Ben. And you know, I'll be seeing you or Zooming you or FaceTiming you very soon. <laughs> talk soon, man. Take care. Thanks, everyone.